Once Around Antares. So Antares is the 15th brightest star in the night sky and the lead star of the constellation of Scorpius, the scorpion, the one that killed Orion. And there's a reason that Scorpius and Orion are opposite each other in the night sky. In fact, it's all part of the legend of keeping them eternally apart. So one, from my point of view, is a winter constellation and the other a summer constellation. And in fact, Scorpius in the summer just makes it above the hedge. It's quite uh, low in the sky from my latitude. So best seen if you're a bit further south than uh, where I am at 52 degrees north here in Cambridge. So Antares is a very bright star, magnitude just uh, 0.6 to 1.6, and it does vary a little bit. This is pretty common with these type of stars. They pulsate and their brightness changes. Mesopotamian astronomers called it the heart of the Scorpion, which makes sense, the brightest star in the constellation of Scorpius. And the Greeks called it Antares, Antares or Antares, the rival of Mars. And this is due to its red-orange colour. It does look just like Mars looks in the sky when you observe it with the naked eye. Now, this photograph of, of it um, is in fact in false colour. It's an infrared image showing it as white. So uh, that's uh, rather a different view of it. But picking up all of that lovely nebulosity, all those clouds of gas that are around it, of which more later. It's about 550 light years distant from the sun, determined by the usual method of triangulating using the Earth's orbit or using a satellite like Hipparchos shown there. Gaia doesn't have quite the uh, ability to measure these very bright stars. It's uh, overwhelmed by the power output, which um, it's really designed for much fainter objects. So we're relying on these other methods at the moment to estimate this 550 light year distance. But we can get an image of the surface. This is, is an actual image rather than an artist's impression of the surface of this red supergiant star. Temperature 3660 Kelvin and estimated to be about 76,000 times brighter than our sun. And the image was made by the VLT in Chile, the Very Large Telescope. In fact, by combining all of them as what's known as an interferometer to give you the resolving power based on the distance between the most extreme um, path length between the separate mirrors rather than the size of the mirror themselves, a technique that was first developed here in Cambridge by Martin Ryle with radio telescopes and then pioneered again using the Coast Telescope here in Cambridge um, in a bunker at the radio telescope site where they linked se separate mirrors together brought the beams of light into an underground lab. Um, it's uh, a very James Bond down there, I can tell you. And uh, that joins the light together, gives you the fantastic resolution to be able to see these bright and dark features on the surface of a star 500 light years away. I think that's amazing. It's an enormous size. We've got it compared with some of the other stars there, Betelgeuse is smaller than Antares. This comes in somewhere between 600 and 800 times the radius of our sun. It's quite difficult to define the edge, though. I've heard it said that the outer layers of these red supergiants are essentially a red-hot vacuum and just thin out almost to nothing as you go further away. So it's not possible really to quite pin down the edge. But if this was at the center of the solar system, the inner part of the solar system would be toast. This would have swamped all the inner planets right out and beyond Mars, out into the asteroid belt, and it's going almost all the way out to Jupiter's orbit. Absolutely enormous. We estimate the mass at about 12 times the mass of the sun, and it was probably 15 to 17 when it was born and has been losing mass ever since. These large stars tend to have a fairly weak grip on their outer 
envelope. And uh, once they swell up into these enormous sizes, they tend to uh, soon find that that is lost. And around about 11 to 15 million years old. So it's somewhere on, well, between the 9M Sun and 25M Sun tracks that you can see on this Hertzsprung-Russell diagram of temperature, color versus mass and luminosity. And it would, will have departed the main sequence uh, several million years ago now, become a red giant and swollen right up. And it might be a little bit older. It might be having another go round. And you can see that in the uh, trajectories here. The stars leave the main sequence line, travel horizontally across the diagram as they build an inert core of first helium. And then when the helium ignites, they go on what's called a blue loop. They whiz back left across the diagram, becoming more efficient. They're now using all that core mass, carrying out the second stage of fusion, turning helium into carbon and oxygen. And then um, they build an inert carbon oxygen core and lose efficiency again and end up moving back to the right. So they go through that uh, loop, the blue loop, um, passing through the yellow color in both directions and end up as an advanced uh, red giant star. And they may do that several times, each time with uh, greater rapidity because the subsequent stages of nuclear fusion don't last very long. And we're not quite sure whether Antares is on its first go around or its second go around here, which is why we have um, some variability as to the estimate of its age. But eventually, these stars will go through all those nuclear fusion stages. And at 12 solar masses, this is going to explode. It's above the 10.5 solar mass cutoff. Below that, you will get some sort of white dwarf star and a, a puffing off of the outer layers. But this is over that. And so within the next million years or so, it will explode as a type two core collapse supernova, probably leaving a neutron star behind. Um, it would have to be 20 to 25 solar masses for it to create a core large enough to form a black hole. But when it does blow, it will be as bright as the full moon and easily seen in broad daylight. But uh, that won't be tomorrow. It's probably got a million years or so left. Um, as indeed has uh, the other red giant Betelgeuse. It has a companion, and there's a lovely photograph of Antares with its companion, the B star, next to it, first reported during an occultation when the moon passed in front of Antares and blocked out the light from the main star, revealing this little magnitude 5.5 companion. You'd be able to see that uh, just with the eye, uh, were it not so close to the powerhouse of the main A star. And as you can see from the history there, it was about 1844, 46, it was seen again. And then that man, William Rutter Dawes, Mr. Eagle Eyes himself, was able to measure the separation at three and a half arc seconds back in the year 1847. Um, we actually have his telescope still on site here, uh, the Thorogood telescope, as it's known, which was, I think, the one that was used to do this. Um, and that's in a, a dome up on the lawn at the Institute of Astronomy, and we still use it. Um, so those two stars are in orbit around each other. And it's since uh, Rotter Dawes's time, the separation between them has closed somewhat. We think the orbit is somewhere between 1,200 and 2,500 years in length. Different estimates have been made of that. And at that sort of level, you can understand why in just a couple of hundred years, it's quite difficult to pin down the orbital period. We think that the B star is around seven solar masses in its own right, so quite big and with a temperature of 18,500, which you can tell from the spectrum of its light. Um, but 
curiously to the eye, although it is a blue-white colour itself, if you can see Antares in the same field of view with its highly red colour, the uh, brain loves to co do colour correction and white balance, as the photographers would call it, and try and balance the uh, perception of colour. So uh, some people describe Antares B as a blue-green colour, but if you can't see Antares, it looks blue-white. So it's a, a trick of the way that the eye brain works that creates that. So a fascinating little uh, companion star there. And the Antares system is part of the Scorpius Centaurus Association, the Scosen OB collection of bright stars, thousands of stars over in a very dense region away from the sun. So we in the sun are in the local bubble, of which is a, a region off to the top right, uh, sorry, top left of the diagram there. And then the lower right, it contains many uh, collections of stars, uh, the overall association divided into several groups there, and uh, some very deep nebulae like the coal sack and so forth. And that we're looking in towards the center of the galaxy in this direction. Now, these stars are around about that 11 million years old, all having been born together. So it's uh, been a very, very active region. And when we look at it, we see one of the most fascinating clouds of nebula material being lit by the light of Antares, called the Rho Ophiuchus cloud. Uh, very beautiful indeed in this astronomical photograph, showing uh, all the different uh, colors, the reflection of blue light, the red from lit up, uh, emitting uh, hydrogen gas, and some dark dust lanes of cold material there as well. So I'll leave you with a picture of Antares glowing red in the night sky there, and I hope you've enjoyed that trip once around it. Thanks very much for listening. Bye for now.